So what you're going to hear from me today is sort of the, the combination of all that. What I have to say about that now, what the troubles are, the struggles have been for me, and maybe they're the same for you. I have a couple of names that I'll share with you too, because I think they're relevant to what I have to say. And they always say that if you, if you share something about you and who you are, that people will connect with what you have to say. Maybe if you know my names, oh, that's why he talks about that stuff. So yeah, about 30 years ago, I was given a name down at Kindly. It's a, a beautiful man who's passed away now, a tall man, Spitegman. He named me Apio Mahka. And that's a far runner. I used to do that quite a bit back then, but um, when I got a chance, I asked him to tell me more about why he gave me that name. He went like this with his hands. And he said, uh, you got some people who live over here, and you got other people who live over here. They don't get longer. They don't understand each other. They don't connect. He said, what you're going to do is you're going to spend time with these people. Over here and spend time. He said, keep running to bring them closer together. Good job description. Okay. Uh, my other name is Stahai Moskwa. Bob Cardinal gave me that. Stahai Moskwa. That's a big bear. Which uh, in this really old culture, we're still trying to learn that bears have to do with healing. So I think there's a real interesting connection between the two names that I think about as carefully as I can do in court. So I'm a, I'm a professor in the Faculty of Education. I've been doing that for about 17 years. So what you're going to hear from me today is sort of a reflection on curriculum, pedagogy, education, and all that stuff. I'm also a uh, Canada Research Chair, which is a very kind of intimate position to have. So it seems like a lot of responsibility. Um, and I, I just hope that something good can happen. So that's part of the group. Okay. So in terms of teacher education, in terms of curriculum, pedagogy, how we teach, why we teach that way. Um, I'm like a lot of you, I'm sort of preoccupied with all the challenges we face these days. This trajectory we're on, how it's, uh, make sure you use that to lift up. All the challenges we face trajectory we're on, how it's not sustainable. It's not going to last. And uh, we need to start to adjust. We need to start to help our children adjust. We need to help them understand how to live differently. And I, I don't see much happening in, in, in the field that is actually addressing this. And so my I guess my preoccupation is can we can we take you know people who want to be educators can we be mindful of their academic training and respect that but also you know make sure that uh, they are given insights and experiences that um, help them to understand how to proceed differently you know and I guess the mantra I've used that I know Jason heard this summer was, if I expect people to teach differently, they have to be taught differently. We can't continue to, to just sort of crank out PowerPoint presentations and expect that people are gonna somehow make it, make it a transformation. So this is the challenge we face. And uh, I think that uh, what I just said is, is rooted in our relationships to knowledge. You know? 
And uh, the most important thing that I feel I can, I can do is help bring about some kind of transformation, how people understand knowledge, how they experience knowing. That affects them as human beings, not just intellectually, but in, in a, a whole way, in ways that we know are, are most meaningful. Um, and this work, as I've learned, the work of asking what is knowledge, what is knowing, how is it produced, what's it for? These are uh, intensely cultural questions. And they're, they're founded, the responses that we might give are founded in, are rooted in cultural assumptions. And uh, one thing I've learned is that uh, you know, schools and schooling, the schooling culture is very much uh, founded in cultural assumptions that descend from Europe. And this is not, uh, I understand this is not uh, new information for us, but what I notice is that whenever we try to make innovations or try to do different programming that we think is gonna make a difference, we fail to address the foundational kind of structures or systems that are in place. We tinker on the surface and we accept the cultural assumptions that come from the enlightenment as a common sense, as sort of givens, as unquestioned kind of systematic ways to think about knowledge. And if you're going to be serious about it, this is how it needs to be done. And so what I notice happening often is that we have these good initiatives, these good ideas that involve indigenous themes, issues, knowledge, but they don't have the foundational part to support. And so they always get deformed. It undermines the integrity of the knowledge systems that they arise from because the foundation that they're put upon does not support what they're looking for, right? So this is, this is a, like a key issue. And uh, I've been spending a lot of time lately trying to help people understand the ways in which colonial worldview is embedded in what I'm talking about. And again, this is not new information for us. Most of us are very aware of this, but the challenge is what do we do? How can we, how can we unlearn? That's the phrase or the concept that I've been using lately. How can we unlearn colonial knowledge? So just to take a little detour into some of that so you understand how I think about this, what's, what's, why I think that's so important is that uh, I think, you know, we just had Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> and if you think about what Christopher Columbus did, however long ago that was, uh, what we've seen since that time all around the world is very gradual, centuries long position particular way to understand life and, and what it means to be a human being. And uh, education systems are, are the places where this has been most intensely imposed on. And uh, if you think about the European experience uh, back then and what it has to do with us today, I think you know, it, to me it all connects because of course, once they developed the ability, technologies to travel around the world the way they did and encounter what they considered to be new people, new land, new products, new wealth, you have all of this stuff rushing back to Europe. It must have been so overwhelming. All these different products, all this different kind of uh, information, I would say, all around the world. And so it makes sense that at that time they were preoccupied with how to classify all this stuff. And so from that, I would say we get this preoccupation in terms of knowledge of knowing, of, uh, dividing the world according to kind of arbitrary categories created, race being one. And so this classifying, this categorizing, this dividing the world according to these logics, I would say that most of what happens in K-12 schools is based on 
that sort of preoccupation of learning to divide the world in that way. And so a colonial worldview is based on relationship. And um, I, you know, I have to say, it's important to say that, of course, there have been some benefits from that way of thinking about knowledge. Uh, most of our technologies that we enjoy now are based on that, that kind of logic. It's founded in that way of understanding. Scientific method is based on that kind of stuff, I would say, at its base. Even the vaccines that you know, we relied on amidst the COVID, we're really thankful that someone knew how to create those. But again, we're at the point where we realize that we need to balance. We're missing quite a few insights, right? So, and I would say, you know, in my studies to try to bring that uh, colonial worldview kind of close to us and how it manifested here in this part of the world. Um, I've studied forts quite a bit in my work. And uh, there's kind of an irony, I would say a tragic irony in how forts have been characterized in the story of the Canadian nation national sort of creation story. Because there's this, this message if you're educated in Canada, like I was, before the forts arrived here, nothing happened. It's like the people were just waiting for someone to come and civilize them. And when the forts arrived, that's when history, before then, there was no history. The tragic irony is, of course, forts typically, I would say, were built at places of That's why they put them. People were already gathering, and the forts you know, looked to take advantage of this gathering place tradition. And this fort here, Fort Edmonton, is a really good fort. It's the most profitable in Hudson Bay Company's network for about a 60 year period. And it's hard to believe, I know, but during this era, fur traders were the richest people, in the world. beaver pelt traders were the richest people. In the world. Crazy. But my reason for bringing that up is in Canada, I would say forts are uh, mythic symbols. And uh, they teach relationships. They teach that they're insiders, insiders, insiders to certain things, outsiders to other things. And this is like a social spatial divide that's been naturalized in Canada. And it affects all kinds of different things to date in terms of justice, in terms of education terms of child welfare, all these different things are, I think, inhabited by four objects still. And, you know, what I'm getting at here is that this is all rooted in our relationships to knowledge and what we accept as true. Carrying on with this, I would say that uh, one of the real difficulties we face is that liberal philosophy, socially, politically, economically, um, is an updated version of colonialism. So liberalism, which developed out of the colonial period in Europe in the, basically in the 19th century, and is sort of accepted all around the world as the proper way to live according to these philosophies. Um, it's, it's very much connected to power and it has the ability to constantly, constantly center itself as the answer to any, any question you might have. It has liberalism at the end. Right? Uh, I would say that liberalism at its root is, is based on understanding difference as problems. And so it's, it's motivated to try to deal with difference by managing it. And, uh, so multicultural policy in Canada is a manifestation of equity, diversity, and inclusiveness is a different manifestation. And this is this is why you know truth and reconciliation talk has pretty much been displaced by EDI talk these days, right? Because liberalism is trying to center itself as the answer to our problems, continually tries to put itself in the center. And because it's associated with power in that way, it can do. So, you know, 
So my, my point in bringing all this up to you is that today, it's my view that <clears throat> the current context is so replete with one way of understanding one understanding of knowledge and knowing that most of us can't actually imagine other knowledge systems or other ways to live. It's become so dominant in our imagination that this is this is a serious problem. And so this is why I've become in my work so focused on trying to give people experiences that help them have a transformation of how they experience knowledge and person with the hope that that will inspire them and encourage them to experiment with it. That's, that's one of the ways, that's the only way that I can see that I can make a contribution to this trap. That to try, try and live with you. Think about ourselves as human beings. Now, one of the things I know is that for many generations through our education system, but other means as well, people have been taught to look elsewhere for sources of inspiration, about how to live differently, how to think about it differently. That's another legacy. So I think part of our challenge is to settle in with the places where we are and let those places, the wisdom that's there, the ancient life that's there, let that guide us. Uh, there's a beautiful book, maybe you've seen. Some it's, it's written by an Australian Aboriginal guy. His name's Tyson Yonfaporda. Uh, I can't remember which community he's from, but the book is called Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save You. And uh, in that book, he has a chapter called Be Like Your Place which I think is such an interesting So to adjust to all these challenges, what he suggests is that we study our place. We study the patterns that exist in the place. We study the life that exists in the place. And we, as human beings, we try to be like that life. We try to follow those patterns to make them part of ourselves. Which is such a to me is such a powerful idea. <clears throat> Does anybody want to say anything right now? Hey. <laughs> I don't need any feedback. Right? I know that's a lot. That's a lot. But um what I want to share right now and kind of make a transition is um, to, sh to basically share with you how I've tried to work in this world. Because, of course, if we're going to take these things up meaningfully, it begins with yourself. I, I can't really speak with integrity about this issue if I haven't worked on it myself, if I haven't gone through the struggles. If I, haven't accepted the fact that I too am colonized. That I have been educated to, to deny relationships. So I've become aware of that and I've tried my best to try to work on that. It's hard. But when I was at Kainai, I would say is when my unlearning began. That's when things happened down there that, that shifted in how I understood knowledge and knowing and how I thought about myself as a human being in relation to the place where I was. And uh, so it's those folks who instigated that for me, brought it up. So when I was a teacher at Kainai, uh, one of the things we did regularly was, as I said, was go to places, sacred sites. And a lot of times the spiritual leaders, ceremonial leaders would come with us lead they would show us you know give us guidance tell us stories but the first place we went to uh, as part of this uh, 
was actually in Montana. So it was only maybe an hour drive from the school across the U.S. border. Of course, for a lot of indigenous folks, that border is pretty arbitrary. So it's savage. So we went to this place. There was about three man logs of us that went. Beautiful people with us. When we arrived, um, the old man gave me some tobacco. He said, Go and work on the circle. So the tobacco. And then we all went inside that circle that I marked off. They did a ceremony. And then they told us what happened. So um, we were overlooking a beautiful little river valley. It's close to the mountains. Uh, it's the Marias River. And they said there was a large encampment of people in this valley that they were looking. It was, uh, Chief was heavy runner, who was a, had a large following of people who wanted to live under his leadership. He had a lot of, people had a lot of respect for him. He was a little man, but, and uh, it was cold. January, 1870. And uh, a lot of the men were away hunting. So it was mostly women and children, older folks that were there. And they woke up in the morning and they were surrounded by American soldiers. So they panicked, of course, as you can imagine. And Heavy Runner went around. He was trying to. It's okay, it's a misunderstanding. I'm straight. And I guess he had a he had a letter in his keeping that he received from a local And he uh, he said, I'll get that letter because it explained that he was a good man. He was in trouble. He said, I'll show up. So he was running, he could see where the officers were. He was running towards him. This letter that shot him. And then they proceeded to shoot up the whole camp. And uh, they had Gatling guns with them. Those are the original machine guns that were on crank. They had three of these. They used them to shoot off the tops of the teepees. The teepees fell down. So they said the name for this place is the place where they were burned. I can't remember how to say it. So after we heard this part, the old man who was telling the story, he went over to my, my teaching partner who was from the community of Mona Big Head. Mona taught English and they taught social studies. He went over to her and put his hand on her shoulder. And he said, There were two children that survived this attack somehow. And they ran away to a neighboring camp. And he said, That's the only reason we know what happened to the children survived in the cold. Because the Americans, obviously, it wasn't in the newspaper. He said, one of those children was your great great grandmother. So I could like physically feel her response to that. But she heard. So that was remarkable. And after we were done, I, I just remember sitting there trying to take this all in, and, and the students, there's about 40 of them. Nobody said anything. They just kind of drifted down into the valley where this massacre had taken place. We spent the rest of the afternoon just visiting with that place. Yeah, that's when I was sitting there watching all this. And, uh, that's what happened. The healing themselves, healing this place. We're taking this place back through the ceremony. And yeah, I'd never been taught like that. 
I've never had anybody address me mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically all at the same time. It's never happened to me. So I guess what I can say about that is that that experience that I had, and I had many more after that, but those experiences, they meant so much to me that I wanted to even just have a little bit of that for my experience to figure out how to address them intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, physically. So they can feel that, what I felt on that day. And so that's become a, a real big motivation for me. And uh, I would say, you know, when I came back home here and I was struggling to try to make sense of all of this and what it had to do with me and what my role could be, um, I was drawn to this river. And now that I think about it, um, I, I think it was uh, obviously not, it's not a random thing to happen. As I was trying to sort this out, as I was trying to understand friendship, as I was trying to think about life differently, knowledge differently, I found myself walking beside this river. And I would say now, 20 years onto it, that this river is the one that taught me about friendship. It's the one that showed me many ways how to how to proceed differently. And um Gee C Saskatchewan CP, that name literally refers to walking. And I didn't know this, but when I was drawn to walk beside it, I didn't know that the river invites you to do that in that sort of wisdom way. So it's the river that flows at a slip. very accurate. I encourage you all to do that, to go walk beside it, see what it can teach you. Um, and so this is what I started doing, is walking, running beside that river regularly, probably daily. And as I was walking, I was telling myself stories about who I was in relation to this place trying to make sense of all the different things that I had learned, trying to honor kinship, although I wouldn't have been able to articulate it. And uh, one day, I was teaching a class, and it was a beautiful day like this, and I thought, this is goofy that we're sitting in some this bunker on a beautiful day. So I said, Let's go outside, and I just took a took the students down to the country. I just told them a few stories, just tried to share some things with them that I thought would matter to them. And uh, I've been doing that now. Come on in. I've been doing that now for quite a while. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, it's 43. Just getting to the good part. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this river really had my attention, and, and uh, what I found is, is the more I did the walks, the more requests came to them. And before COVID, I probably did 80 or 90. And uh, I really, honestly, I'm not trying to just play the humble game. I don't think it has a lot to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I should have had one of those things on. I, I just think that uh, there's a lot of people different people from all the different traditions who are curious that they realize that there's a lot they have to do. 
and there's people who want to learn. So they come in. I just do my best because I have very introductory kind of understandings. Uh, some people think that I'm a knowledge keeper, but say that I just listen to. But yeah, that walk has become a really important part of it. And I, one of the things that I think is really important about it is, again, it gets, gives me a chance to address people intellectually and spiritually together at the same time. I think, again, following the wisdom of that in terms of knowledge and knowing what it means to be a human being, that's something that people find meaningful. But there's a, an extra layer to this. So in the Hiawe, when, you know, one of the wisdom concepts that I've paid attention to is, is Wakoto. And uh, here's how I would explain Wakoto. So Wakoto has to do with kinship. So it has to do with understanding how you're related, how you're a relative. And so... You can think of it, I think of it as concentric circles where you have your immediate family and then you have your extended family and then you have your community. You have other human beings, right? So, um, although we're not the same, although we're not family, we're related because we all need to eat. We all need to breathe. We all need to love. The understanding of life, we're relatives. But Akotuan is also about extending kinship between humans to life. So, human to sky, human to sun, human to stars, human to the earth, human to planet, human to animal, human to the water, so on, right? So, it's, it's about our commitments and our responsibilities, they have them to us and us to them. And uh, so Wakotuan is about how we're enmeshed in a whole bunch of relationships that we depend upon first. So what they say is, we have So it's, yeah. it's about being enmeshed in relationships. And what they say, what I've learned is the intelligent human response when you acknowledge those relationships and how you're a part of them is to try to live your life in a way that makes sure that those relationships are healthy, not just for you, right? so they can carry on. Right? And part of that is what they call in English ancestral thinking. So that involves thinking like an ancestor, thinking past the span of your own lifetime. You have the ability to think back to your ancestors and what you inherited from them, what your responsibilities to them. And you have the ability to think ahead to the generations yet to come and, and what your obligations and responsibilities are to them. So what Gotowin inspires this ancestry that you Try not to think in a selfish, preoccupied way. Try to think in a much more relational way about life and living and how you're involved in that, right? And so, one of the things that uh, I learned just in the last few years. And this comes from uh, Reuben Quinn from Saddle Lake First Nation, who uh, shared the sort of etymology of Wakoto. In other words, how that word is comprised, what it actually means. And so what Reuben shared is that Wakoto and refers to bent over like your back is bent, moving on the land, 
reciprocity concept. So Wakotuan is literally about moving on the land and bent over wave, holding hands with all the life. And, and so there's another concept in the Hiwiwin that I didn't know about that invites you to walk, to learn about kinship. And again, what I wanted to say is that I was walking, drawn to walk sort of instinctually. And I didn't know that I was connecting with the wisdom tradition in this area about how you actually learn about that. So by walking, I learned, as Leroy Little Bear said, um, to be recognized. So that's, the, I think, the challenge is that if you, if we want to have a different relationship with knowledge, a different relationship with knowing, if we want to make a transition to being a different kind of human being, to living our lives differently, walking in that kinship way is a key part of that in this area, right? So to be like your place, as I said earlier, it requires walking on the land and paying attention to all the life that's there. And I'll just say uh, the other thing that uh, has really helped me understand knowledge and knowing and what it means to be human differently is uh, a course that we taught at, at the day uh, Dea, Bob Cardinal and I took uh, five or six versions of it. But this course is based on uh, the 13 moons, the, the calendar, traditional calendar. Area. And, uh, you know, following Bob's lead, they just try to keep things simple, try not to overcomplicate things, and, and really put people in a position where they can um, experience learning differently. Um, because when we go through our education, like the young people are, we get used to being told what to think, we get used to having knowledge imposed on us all these interferences, right? But this 13 moon class, it's really about asking people to study them and to study a place. And we do it for a whole year, trip around the sun, whole 13 moon cycle. And uh, give students, people participating in the class, all kinds of creative ways to express it. And uh, again, as I said at the beginning, what what I've learned from that course is that uh, it gives people a chance to have a transformation, in how they experience that, how they think about that, with the hope that it can carry on. And so that's been another big thing for me, to try to, like I said, respond to all these challenges we have, recover from colonialism and relationship to now. So just to finish my I guess my summary would be if relationship to me is the problem, if I'm right about it, that's what made the paradox this idea of denying relationships, then the most important thing we can do in our life and our work is repair those relationships that have been denied and renew them on different terms. And I would say that probably the most damaging form of relationship denial that is imposed on us through becoming more educated is the ways in which our intellect is separated from the other parts of us. So we experience kind of disassociation inside of us when we form of educated. And so many of us struggle. So this idea of putting that back together somehow is I think the challenge we have. And it's only when when that begins that a lot of other things begin. So that's been my experience. But if you skip that, you're not going to make much progress. How? Yeah. Thanks to you all. Thanks for listening. Um, anything else you want to say? <laughs>